In the last lecture we concentrated uh, on the new subsistence strategies that were adopted by the Epipaleolithic hunter-gatherers. We saw how the broad spectrum strategy combined with the storage of harvested cereals and pulses and grasses made the Epipaleolithic period different from all earlier periods of human prehistory. We noted the signs of pressure on hunted resources through the Epipaleolithic and the steep and serious increase of pressure in the final Epipaleolithic and the earliest Neolithic, 10th millennium BC. And we saw that just after that, the first evidence emerges for the domestication of both plants and animals during the climatic optimum of the early Holocene period. In this lecture, uh, I turn to the other side of the coin, sedentary uh, societies. I trust it's obvious that sedentism, living in one place for most of the time or all of the time, and subsistence based on storage are interdependent. The conventional wisdom is that environmental pressures pushed hunter-gatherer groups to adapt their strategies and the adoption of a storage-based strategy meant greater sedentism. I disagree. I think that demographic, social and cultural factors were initially the drivers of change in settlement, which depended on corresponding changes in economic strategy. But at this stage, can we simply assume that subsistence strategy and settlement strategy are interdependent? In fact, at the beginning of the Epipaleolithic, where I've started the story, things had already changed. We saw that the hunter-gatherer group at Ahalo II were harvesting many species, uh, that the hunter-gatherer uh, uh, were harvesting many species of plant and were apparently spending the whole year there. The classic hunter-gatherer bands of earlier times in the Paleolithic are believed to have been groups that moved around a large territory, shifting their camp a number of times, maybe six or twelve or even twenty times within a year's cycle. The classic mobile hunter-gatherer group was actively egalitarian, accumulated few goods and hunted and gathered from day to day. Anthropologists tell us that this is not the way that all recent hunter-gatherers have operated. The French anthropologist Alain Testard has argued that hunter-gatherers who engage in storage, like our Epipaleolithic <coughs> hunter-gatherers, are more similar to farmers than to mobile hunter-gatherers, who forage and hunt for food day by day. The need for the social management mechanisms for the storage of uh, stored food supply is the same as that that farmers require, and no matter whether their <coughs> harvests were wild plants or cultivated crops. James Woodburn, another anthropologist, defines two hunter-gatherer philosophies in terms of immediate return and delayed return. Delayed return hunter-gatherers are like our epipaleolithic hunter-gatherers. They may invest in making nets or traps or fishing weirs or they may employ technologies such as smoking or salting to preserve food or they may collect food resources such as nuts or cereals that can be stored to be consumed over a period of time. On the basis of uh, reading across the ethnographic literature and his own ethno-archaeological fieldwork, <coughs> Lewis Binford uh, has likewise differentiated between hunter-gatherers who forage day by day, moving their camp many times over the course of the year, and those whom he calls collectors, who are logistically organised to maximise the amount of resources that can be concentrated from a base camp that may be occupied for a few weeks, or several months, or even year-round. Our Epipaleolithic hunter-gatherers are of the kind that engage in storage and sedentism, and they are very different then from the classic mobile hunter-gatherer uh, bands, and there's the anthropologists telling us. <coughs> Archaeologists have a problem establishing hunter-gatherer sedentism, as they've had problems accepting that grinding stones are for grinding food things. The purists will say, well, yes, you can see they were there a long time, but you can't see they were there the whole year, and you can't say they were there year after, just because they put stones together and make what looks like a permanent house. Living in one place throughout the year, year in, year out, is very difficult to, to prove. But I think we can get around the problem, quite simply, of whether we can identify this site as fully sedentary or that site as um, only partly sedentary. It's a waste of time to try to spot the moment when almost fully sedentary hunter-gatherers become fully sedentary. Rather, I should be concerned with several interlinked aspects of the trend towards sedentism and um, from sedentism on into larger and larger communities. For our purposes, the trend is enough. <coughs>
there are some fairly obvious social implications for groups who have adopted a broad spectrum and harvesting and storage economy. They have to be organised to live with the greater investment of time and effort needed for the exploitation of small, fast-moving species. Similarly, they need an investment in specialised hunting equipment, nets, boats, traps, as well as heavy groundstone equipment for pounding and grinding hard uh, seed foods. Because they depend on having access to several complementary ecological zones for hunting in order that they can stay in one place while they consume their stored harvests, their choice of location for settlements is fairly limited. The ethnographic evidence is that hunter-gatherers usually operate within about a two-hour walk of their base camp. And we shall see examples of good locations for accessing multiple ecological zones. And there is another implication of the trend towards sedentism that was important to Kent Flannery's and Lewis Binford's theories explaining the beginning of farming. I mentioned it briefly in the last lecture. Women in mobile hunter-gatherer groups tend to have children at spaced intervals, sometimes averaging around five years. The statistics from small-scale sedentary farming societies, and our sedentary hunter-gatherers are not so different, as the anthropologists tell us, is that birth spacing is significantly less than that. So as the group shifted towards sedentism, even a slight reduction in birth spacing for females would, over time, as I've suggested, lead to demographic growth. And in that sense, since the natural food resources in any area are finite, the trend towards sedentism ultimately leads to a disequilibrium between population and available wild food resources. I'm repeating this diagram because I want to emphasize how long that time span is with which we're concerned, the Epipaleolithic in particular. The Epipaleolithic period is more than uh, 10,000 uh, years long and then early Neolithic, the Aceramic Neolithic, is uh, worth uh, at least 3,000 years or more. <coughs> this diagram is not drawn to scale, you may have noticed that, and that disguises an important phenomenon, the changing pace of change itself. The way that archaeologists slice up time using the artefacts recovered from archaeological sites is a proxy index of the pace of cultural change. For the couple of hundred thousand years of the Middle Paleolithic, there's virtually no cultural change discernible in the archaeological record. To get to the Upper Paleolithic, it's about 20,000 years long in Southwest Asia, and the specialist can identify whether a particular assemblage of lithics is early or late in the period, in that time span. Within the Epipaleolithic, the lithic specialist can tell us a good deal more. They can identify three main subfaces just within the, la the later Epipaleolithic. <clears throat> when we reach the Neolithic, archaeologists are beginning to talk in terms of centuries. With the advent of Homo sapiens, then, the pace of cultural change increases. And I shall be arguing tomorrow that the pace of change quickens sharply in the period we are considering, particularly at the beginning of the Neolithic. We encountered the site of a hollow too in the last lecture when I uh, summarised the evidence of the subsistence strategies. Site, just to summarise, dates around 23,000 years ago in the last glacial maximum when the climate in the southern Levant was cooler and drier than today, a good deal drier. It's, remarkable, it's a remarkable site that was discovered in the late 1980s uh, and has been excavated only when the water levels in the Sea of Galilee drop low enough to expose it. The site extends over at least 2,300 square metres in area. And while it has remarkable preservation of botanical remains, it can only be reached in the drought years or when too much water is being extracted for irrigation. 142 botanical taxa have so far been identified from the remains, including 19,000 grass seeds, many of them to species level. The faunal remains are the classic profile of the broad spectrum strategy. Plenty of gazelle, fallow deer, but also fox hare, many species of birds, lots of fish, tortoise and so on. One thing is worth adding. While the range of grass seeds that were being collected is remarkable, and here are some of the taxa uh, uh, lined up along the bottom, um, it wasn't a very productive strategy. 
a group of Israeli scientists has put together figures from a number of epipaleolithic sites and found that, as you would expect, people tended to concentrate their efforts on the cereals in preference to the small seeded grasses. The percentage of small seeded grasses at Ohalo 2 at the beginning of the epipaleolithic is the highest of all the sites for which they had information at 34.6. This graph shows us the um, relative value of grass seeds in terms of how much, um, um, what their size is. Yeah? And what you can see is that the wild wheat and barley at the far end of the graph are hugely more valuable as seeds because they're so much larger than all the other kinds of grass seeds that they were collecting. So they were collecting lots of seeds but it wasn't actually uh, all that sophisticated uh, a, a strategy. If they could have found more wild wheat and barley they could have saved themselves a lot of, of trouble. <clears throat> this is the site uh, in one of the seasons when it was excavated. You can appreciate they don't have too much trouble finding water for their water sieving and flotation um, efforts. The site was well chosen for its access to complementary ecological zones. Obviously they've got access to the Sea of Galilee itself and its shores, uh, and behind the land rises into hills to the southwest and the southeast. So far they've found several small, roughly circular huts within the area that they've excavated. That's what some of them look like. Within the huts uh, there were um, bedding areas. Uh, the huts themselves are built of uh, branches and brushwood uh, and their in interiors uh, are, uh, were intensively uh, brushed and cleaned and swept so that they turn into, into hollows. And at the end of their lives huts were comprehensively burnt which is very useful from our point of view because we get to see exactly what kinds of twigs and branches they were using to build them with, to bake them with. The scorching and the immersion uh, have uh, ensured lots of organic preservation and within the huts there are bedding areas uh, around a, 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 um, a made of uh, bundles of a particular kind of tussocky grass uh, set on a bed of clay uh, in a horseshoe shape around a, a central hearth. The huts are small, only two or three metres across and many of the activities of everyday life would have been carried out in the open. Around the site there were grinding stones and, and rubbers and a recent investigation of the surface of the grinding stones as I said has, has shown starches. The huts seem to be clustered but of course we don't know whether they were all in use at the same time. The disposal of waste also seems to have been structured. As you can see all the, um, all the rubbish materials are, are being dumped at one side of the site. There are external hearth areas, uh, which might suggest communal food preparation, and uh, over to the left of the plan, there's a single grave. It's the burial of a single body, uh, an adult male, one of whose hands was disabled, uh, and he'd suffered a penetrating wound in his rib cage. Whether that was the cause of death uh, isn't clear. The police, as I say, have an open mind. The next site we'll look at is Malaha, or in modern Hebrew, Ainan. It dates to the last part of the Epipaleolithic, the opposite end of the Epipaleolithic from Ohala, although it's not so very far away, and has become virtually the type site for culture of this period in the southern Levant. It is generally thought that communities became larger and more sedentary than the typical mobile hunter-gatherer band only in the final Epipaleolithic Natufian, as this is called. But I could give you examples of sites that date to the middle of the Epipaleolithic period that are large, as extensive as 2.3 hectares, that accumulated a significant stratigraphic depth, counted in metres, not centimetres, have rich material culture that indicates long-term residence and a full range of activities, and have some stone-built structures and burials. In short, the Natufian does not arrive on the scene as a big bang, Rather, it is another step change in a process that's already millennia old. But Malacca was an open settlement, not in a cave site or a rock shelter like those that had been excavated by Dorothy Garrett back in the 1920s and 1930s. The radiocarbon dates show that it was occupied for almost 2,000 years. Jean Perrault, 
As I said before, its first excavator estimated that there may have been as many as 50 circular houses at one time, and he therefore popping five people into each building estimates 250 population. This is the earliest levels that they've uh, uh, reached or they've got. They, these are dug into subsoil uh, at uh, um, Malacca. <coughs> and uh, uh, the um, excavated area only gives us two uh, structures, as you can see, two uh, roughly circular structures. One of them is actually D-shaped, the one on the uh, right. Uh, um, and you can also see it's got several walls. It's been rebuilt several uh, times. The other one seems to be circular, although we don't have uh, all of it. Uh, the, the shaded areas that, that are the perimeters are in fact stone walls uh, uh, and the floors of these structures were subterranean, were below ground level, they were, they were dug down. We can take a look at the larger D-shaped structure, here it is under excavation. At this point they've already dug below the floor of it uh, 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 further down so that's why it's got uh, uh, the, the, the central floor area is, is missing in this picture. In this reconstruction uh, drawing, you can see uh, how it was put together. You've got a series of uh, posts in holes, and you can see some of the stone packing for those posts, clearly visible, at uh, arc of posts uh, following the line of the wall. In fact, in that photograph, you can also see that there's more than one uh, wall uh, there that's been rebuilt uh, two or three times. Underneath here, as they excavated below the level you can see here, they found a cluster of simple primary burials. In fact, we can call back the plan of the earlier phase for this uh, and see uh, that there's a whole cluster of burials in the center of the, this D-shaped structure below the floor. It's a strange building. It does have domestic debris in it, but the domestic debris is stacked neatly in places here and there. It's got three hearths, which seems a bit excessive for one house, you know? uh, and it's got something like 12 burials underneath the floor. So even at uh, this stage, before we reach the Neolithic, it raises questions, was this just a house? Or was it a special building whose purpose was centered on the bearers below, or what was it? Before we leave Malaha, I should say that in the later levels, the houses uh, uh, become more, more or less uh, um, uh, normal, if you like. There's a, a cluster of them, smaller, smaller circular houses with uh, uh, burials in pits in amongst the, uh, the houses. So things change. We're going to move on to a site in Jordan. It shows on the map where it is. It's called Wadi Hama 27, uh, which it was found during a survey, which is, and it's just its survey number uh, that uh, we see here. And I'm using this just simply to make the point that uh, Ainan Malaha, which we've been looking at, is not unique. It's not the only site like this. There are a number of sites. And again, people say, ah, oh, well, yes, Ainan, but it's the exception. There are other sites which are much smaller, much simpler, much more ephemeral, which is true, but there are other sites like um, uh, Ainan with heavily built massive structures. Wadi Hama 27 is situated on a valley on the east side of the Jordan. Like Malaha, it has large, circular, semi-subterranean buildings with stone revetting walls, which you can make out uh, in the uh, complicated plan here. But I can't resist showing you this stone which is in fact put together from several fragments it had been it's a large stone which had had a, had a decorated face it then got broken up and reused as separate pieces of stone in in rebuilding of, of a building so we don't know where it came from but again something strange uh, going on uh, in uh, the pre-neolithic in the epipaleolithic it seems rather strange that there were several caches of that were left in the buildings when they were finally abandoned. They included these two clusters like this one, the, the mortars and pestles, very well made in, in, in black basalt. There were also about a dozen bone sickles, some with the flint blades still set within them, deliberately left behind, deposited in the, in the buildings when they were uh, um, abandoned. We've seen circular stonewalled semi-subterranean constructions in late epipaleolithic settlements. Now we'll see what happens when we cross the great chronological divide into the Neolithic. Not very much. Certainly the ways of producing chipstone tools change, which is why archaeologists say, ah, we're in the Neolithic. Even I can do that bit. But circular semi-subterranean buildings continue into the early A-ceramic Neolithic uh, to be succeeded only later by rectilinear architecture. <coughs> 
We're going to look very briefly at two sites of the earliest Neolithic. Uh, one is uh, Kemer's Dera in northern Iraq, uh, where, where uh, I excavated in the 19, late 1980s. Uh, it was a small settlement uh, that was brought to my attention while I was engaged in international salvage archaeology work on the, in the Tigris Valley, northwest of Mosul in Iraq. And the other one is uh, Jeff al Ahmar, which was another salvage excavation in the Euphrates Valley in the 1990s, dug by uh, Daniel Stordeur, French archaeologist. Kemistera showed the classic signs of being a small open settlement of a community of hunting harvesters on my very first visit to it. The radiocarbon dates, after we'd done some excavation and got the dates, confirmed that it indeed dated to the very beginning of the Aceramic Neolithic period, in the centuries immediately following 10,000 BC. It had been trashed by the building of a new bypass road around the town of Tel Afa, and then further damaged by a large water pipeline and two telecommunication cables that were laid alongside the new road. We were able to find two small areas that were less seriously damaged than the rest, and in one area there were some semi-subterranean houses. There were no retaining walls, simply lime-rich mud plaster facing to form the walls and the floor surfaces. Our experience of excavating in the interior of these houses was quite different from Phil Edwards' discovery that the interiors of houses at Wadi Hama 27 were literally filled with domestic debris. At Kermesdere, most activities had been conducted outside the house and the interiors had been swept clean until the day that the house was finally abandoned. That's not at all what an archaeologist wants to find, of course, but it makes a very dramatic switch in behaviour between the final Epipaleolithic and the beginning of the Neolithic. It took a lot of time to work out what was going on and to disentangle the horizontal stratigraphy of three successive subterranean structures, each of which had been replastered up to seven times and remodelled once or twice and all stood on more or less the same spot. A quite unexpected feature of this and other houses in the area of the settlement was the construction of pairs of plastered clay pillars built around a vertically set stone slab. This house, the first in the sequence, had two pairs of pillars. Only one pillar could be reconstructed on paper from fragments. It had uh, been remodelled uh, at least once uh, to become much more of a block shape, but its original form in the centre of the screen here could, if you were imaginative, be thought to be slightly human shaped. I tried to avoid that, that because I didn't want to cause trouble in the press, but it did cause trouble. Other people saw it and, and said it was anthropomorphic, the world's oldest statue, mm -hmm. and I got into trouble. After several replasterings and some internal remodelling, the roof of this building was removed and the clay pillars were thrown down, their central stone cores broken in pieces. Then the whole cavity was filled with about 24 cubic metres of domestic debris and rubble and a new house was built in its place, partly overlapping with the site which they just carefully filled in. There's the three. We've been looking at RAB at the bottom of that diagram. We're going to be looking at RAD, which replaced it, and then shortly afterwards, RAA. RAB is the replacement house. And uh, it had um, two, clay, two clay pillars round stone cores, and in between them, uh, it had a slab of stone set on, on edge. In its turn, that house too was replaced and a third house was uh, built. In its first stage, which, is, which isn't shown here, the, that third uh, uh, form of house, the third building there, actually retained the flat stone slab of the previous building in a little niche in the end wall. So they quite clearly were remembering that they were uh, rebuilding from somewhere which had uh, a different form, a different location, but with interesting things which they wanted to retain. And the little niche, they even coloured it red. Uh, um, to mark out this stone which was retained from the previous phase. They then abandoned that idea and rebuilt it a slightly different shape and rebuilt it again a slightly different shape. They moved two pillars which are shown as little circles on the floor in this uh, 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 drawing uh, and set them up again further back in the house but they marked in the floor where they'd been before. So they were doing all sorts of things to remember 
uh, that they that they were part of a tradition that there were uh, there were earlier stages and they even mark those earlier stages and then at the very end of the process this third house was deliberately obliterated but not before some long curated eroded human skulls were brought back and placed in it in the filling in process these were not simple houses as we understand the term, structures that needed periodic maintenance and once in a generation or two needed replacement. Ian Hodder, who's been excavating at Çatalhöyük in central Turkey, has called this kind of um, construction memory house, a memory house, to like. Now we'll switch to Jeff Alakma on the Euphrates, also occupied for several centuries near the beginning of the aceramic Neolithic period, very much the same kind of uh, um, period as Kemes Dere, which we've just been looking at. The orthodox view of the early Neolithic in the Levant had been, for quite a long time, that at this early period in the aceramic Neolithic, people built circular houses with subterranean floors, as they had done at the end of the Epipaleolithic. And that only later were they replaced by rectilinear architecture. <clears throat> this was based on Kathleen Kenyon's experience in the A-ceramic or pre-pottery Neolithic A and then B strata at Jericho in the 1950s. But domestic architecture at Jerfel Akma was clearly in a state of flux. In the same stratum there are buildings that were round, others that were rectilinear and some that were in between. There were simple round houses, semi-subterranean like their epipaleolithic predecessors. I say simple, simple as a structure, maybe, but this one for example was equipped with two pairs of massive wild cattle horns, which you can perhaps make out, that together take up rather a lot of the internal space. There were clusters of circular structures um, forming multi-chambered complexes, but the individual rooms don't seem to communicate, intercommunicate with one another. And there were also rectangular buildings with several rooms. Incidentally, what looked like mud bricks uh, in these are in fact cut lumps of soft limestone put together with mud mortar. It appears that people began to construct rectilinear buildings which involved managing to build right angle corners because they wanted to have several rooms w which intercommunicated for different activities. Here are two examples now of rooms that were equipped with multiple grinding stones. Now we're going into the, have a look at the later aceramic Neolithic. We've seen this slide, this picture before, Abu Huraira, and in the foreground, the Epipaleolithic uh, period, uh, dating to the period of about 11,000 to 10,000 uh, BC, uh, and then at the back of the picture, the later uh, um, aceramic Neolithic. This comes from, uh, from uh, another series of uh, rescue excavations, as I said uh, uh, this morning, in the early 1970s. In the bottom of the trench, you've seen that, uh, and, but what we're concerned with is the uh, building at the, at the back, which you can uh, make out is rectilinear and multi-room. But you also will maybe be puzzled to see that there's no way to get from one room to another. Yeah? They're cell-like rooms, no obvious doorways. Yeah? And what you perhaps make out is that at the tops of the walls, there are some black pop marks. Those are, in fact, stake holes, and the excavators believe that that is the finished height of the mud brick walls, and that was an upper floor made of lighter construction based on a wooden frame, wooden posts. And presumably from that upstairs uh, living floor, you could get down into the cells uh, below. If we head northeast from Abu Huraira up into southeast Turkey, near Diyarbakir, we find more massive buildings represented only by the mud and stone substructures. This one comes from a site called Tayanu Tepesa. The cells may have intercommunicated, but there's no sign of access from the outside. The lower floor provided a storage space that was strictly controlled by the household that lived above. There seems to be a trend from communal storage in the earlier periods towards uh, processing and storage at household level a change that has undoubted social significance. This coincides, of course, with the full incorporation of agricultural and herding practices by the time we get further on into the Aceramic Neolithic. Late Aceramic Neolithic houses in the southern Levant were simpler in form, quite small, single-storey houses, internal posts and stub walls that framed the main doorway supported the roof. <coughs> 
these houses were simple in form, uh, but they were coated with thick lime plaster. And then at the very end of the A ceramic Neolithic stone settlements in southern Jordan, people went in for more and more extravagantly complex ground plans uh, and uh, uh, dry stone walls uh, in some of these structures exist up to first floor uh, level. A reconstruction drawing of what that may have been like with a ladder access down to the basement floor which was divided up into a series of uh, small uh, rooms where ladies conducted food processing by the look of it from the picture. Two of my colleagues have collected information on the size of settlements and charted the changes over time. And here I'm using a simple graph produced by Ian Kite, uh, who's, uh, he was using data from sites in, south in the southern Levant, Israel and Jordan. Near the end of the Epipaleolithic, around 11,000 years ago, settlement sites were small. <coughs> in uh, the early Aceramic Neolithic, around 9,000 BC, they're a little bit larger on average. At the Aceramic Neolithic, as the Aceramic Neolithic progresses, domestic um, sites become larger and larger on, and, and the graph becomes steeper, as you can see, much steeper. So what we can see is an increase in the average size of settlements from the end of the Epipaleolithic through the Neolithic becoming increasingly obvious. Now Ian put in some extra information on his graph indicating the degree of what he calls compartmentalization. In other words, at the early end of the, the process, buildings were simple uh, rooms with no, almost no internal subdivisions. But as you go through time, the degree of uh, the internal walling, breaking the building up into uh, smaller and smaller uh, uh, individual rooms and cells, uh, increases. If we compare this plan of part of the late Epipaleolithic settlement at Malaha, which we've already seen, with these plans of later Aceramic Neolithic settlements in central Turkey, it's easy to see that the ratio of roofed domestic space to open space has changed dramatically. Again, we can borrow a simple graphic from Ian Kite that shows that the ratio uh, was changing over time. In the early period, at the top there, the ratio of um, roof space to open space was 1 to 4 down to 1 to 1 and the size of settlement may have been around 60 Ian estimates. Other people say different figures but it doesn't really matter. If we look at the other end of, of the scale towards the end of the Aceramic Neolithic period then the ratio of roof space to open space has gone up to 4 to 1, 8 to 1 uh, uh, and e even above. Uh, in other words the in the density of occupation on, on sites, the density of building has increased very considerably. And the size of settlement and its estimates of population has increased. If we just take his figure of 60 for the end of the last part of the Epipaleolithic before 10,000 BC, around 11,000 BC at 60, by the end of the Aceramic Neolithic by 8,000 BC he's estimating 3,300. Yeah? I can't do the arithmetic but that's an awful lot yeah, of growth in the size of community living on one site. There are three more matters that need to be brought into the equation if we are to describe what early Neolithic settlements were all about. And the first of these is intramural burial, burial within the settlement. The burials within the settlement at Jericho, more than 400 of them, surprised everyone when Kathleen Kenyon reported them in the 1950s. And let's use Jericho pictures to illustrate what has become the norm at Aceramic Neolithic sites in the Levant. On the left, one of Kathleen Kenyon's great trenches, not obscured by shuttering and all that kind of nonsense. <laughs> and now on the right, uh, a view uh, uh, down uh, into one of those trenches where there are circular semi-subterranean mud uh, brick buildings from the early Aceramic Neolithic. PPNA as she called it. Although a low aceramic Neolithic Jericho produced more than 400 burials, spread across the 2,000 years or so of occupation, the burials can never account for the population that lived within the area of the trenches she excavated. 
we're dealing with a very few individuals whose bodies were, for some reason which we don't know, selected for special treatment. So all these people who count the number of burials and do um, uh, things about gender and, and age profiles, it's nonsense because we've, we've got tiny, tiny numbers of the bodies. We don't have cemeteries of all the burials at all. At Jericho, there were individuals who were uh, buried in an oval pit, and other individuals, like this one, whose burial was later reopened sometime later in order to retrieve the skull. In this case, the mandible was not taken with the cranium. You can see it's been displaced at the top of the, the, the photograph when the cranium was removed. There are secondary burials, that is, collections of bones disarticulated or partly articulated that have been recovered from elsewhere for reburial among the houses. There are single burials and multiple burials. Most peculiar of all, is the great round tower at Jericho attached to the inner side of the circuit wall around the early Aceramic Neolithic settlement, so dating somewhere around 8,500, 9,000 BC. A much reproduced picture. It has an internal staircase that descends from that square hole at the top to another square hole uh, which you can see at the base of the tower. But what's less well known is that at the foot of that staircase there are a number of burials. Um, bundles of human skeletal material representing partial remains of perhaps a dozen individuals. We're still with Jericho pictures here. There were caches of human skulls found at Jericho, often buried in a shallow pit inside a house. Some of those skulls, just a very few, had had facial features modelled in clay and the eyes rendered with shells. Another essay by Ian Kite has brought together some of the evidence of cached skulls with or without model facial features from various sites in the Levant. And in this diagram, he seeks to show that for certain selected individuals, the burial was probably conducted as a ceremony that involved more than a single household. So you've got the circle of birth, death, days after a celebration or a, a commemoration and then uh, the burial. But after some time, we know that in a number of cases, the burial was, re was revisited and the skull was removed. So he produces this second diagram, which shows us that uh, the first uh, part of the cycle, the death of the individual, some ceremonies and the burial, and then after a period which he suggests may have been some years, the grave is revisited, the skull is retrieved, and then after another period, days, perhaps months, perhaps maybe years, we don't know, the skulls may be modelled and held in curated in somewhere, are then finally themselves put together uh, and reburied. So cycles of ceremonies and celebrations involving, Ian suggests in the first place, a fairly small group of kin and, and, and wider family, maybe, uh, in the burial, but then in the further celebrations and ceremonies with the clusters of skulls, which by this time are many years old, representing earlier generations, perhaps involving the whole uh, uh, community. <clears throat> While model skulls are spectacular, they do remain very rare. But here is one of two clutches of model skulls that were found two or three years ago at Tel Aswad, about 30 kilometers east of Damascus in Syria. At this settlement, the two caches of skulls were foundation deposits that inaugurated a shallow hollow which was then used for the burial of a whole series of, of bodies. And I think that's fascinating because the skulls themselves have been retrieved from burials, they've been plastered, they've been curated, they're then brought together and buried. So they represent the end of one of those cycles which are then used to make the beginning of a new cycle with more burials. Yeah? So this idea of activities in cycles was, uh, 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 I think, quite important. The second phenomenon that I want to mention is the nature of these permanently co-resident communities who lived in the settlement sites that we've been considering. At first, Braidwood coined the term village farming, but that model was dealt a serious blow, and indeed Robert Braidwood was seriously uh, angered by it, uh, by Kathleen Kenyon's 1950s excavations of aceramic Neolithic Jericho. Of a size 
which he found with the same size of the Bronze Age city that succeeded it 6,000 years later. And then, as I said this morning, James Mellor actually enjoyed stirring things up uh, when in the 1960s he happily promoted the idea that the much larger site of Chatelieu was a supernova, an urban society that undermined Charles' ideas of an urban revolution in Mesopotamia by more than 3,000 years. In the 1970s, when chiefdoms became the essential, essential accessory of any aspiring processualist, there was an attempt to demonstrate that the late Epipaleolithic societies possessed hereditary chiefly hierarchies. The notion that some of the largest settlements were central places however, cannot be sustained, and the attempt to identify an elite with inherited status and power among the Natufian burials have been criticised and, and uh, demolished, in fact. Rather, we have to think in terms of communities that were organised in some sort of horizontal, segmentary form, perhaps a cluster of small villages or a larger community which was internally segmented in terms of lineages or clans. We're looking into a world that is strangely unfamiliar to us and for which we have little or no relevant uh, experience and almost no anthropological models. Then finally, the third phenomenon I want to draw attention to is the extensive networks of exchange that began to emerge in the Epipaleolithic, but which grow and grow in intensity in the early Neolithic. Forty or fifty years ago, some archaeologists noted that obsidian, the black volcanic glass that naps like flint, was widely present on archaeological sites throughout Southwest Asia. The raw material is relatively rare, however. Not all volcanoes produce obsidian by any means. The known obsidian sources were all in central or eastern Anatolia. This area, on the flanks of a volcanic massif called Goludar, is where obsidian workshops have been found. The density of debris from those obsidian workshops is what make, is making those fields look black. When you walk onto them, you're just crunching centimetres thick of debris from workshops, obsidian workshops. And the French and Turkish team which have been working on that now got several more workshop areas within a few kilometres. Colin Renfrew and his collaborators back in the 1960s, showed that the products of particular sources, and I've made them red here, could be recognised on archaeological sites up to 800 kilometres away. Round each source, Renfrew mapped an inner zone within which settlements used obsidian as the raw material for almost all their chipstone tools. The much wider contour maps the extent of what Renfrew called down the line exchange networks, whereby people kept some of the obsidian they received but passed on some to people in neighbouring settlements further down the line. Thus, obsidian was passed from settlement to settlement in ever-decreasing quantities. Several hundred kilometres from the source, tiny amounts of obsidian were prized and traded, a mere 1% of all the chipstone, or 0.1% of all the chipstone. So it's, it has no economic significance whatsoever. It's prized for how far it's come and how special uh, and exotic it is. All sorts of other materials marine shells from the Mediterranean uh, are found uh, at sites east of the Jordan or in southeast Anatolia and in hundreds of, of sites on the Anatolian and in hundreds on sites on the Anatolian plateau shells from the Red Sea let's get red sea shells there we are red sea shells uh, species that can be recognised as not being Mediterranean but only Red Sea have been identified and the red dots on this map uh, are some of the sites, but only some of the sites, where these have been recognised. And you'll see that they, they occur in central Anatolia uh, and uh, uh, in southeast Anatolia. Again, they're the exact obverse of the obsidian map, with the uh, materials coming from the Red Sea and going hundreds of kilometres north. Some of it. And there's other things as well. Malachite beads from Jordan. Uh, um, and I haven't got the distributions of these because nobody's really studied them and, and uh, put them on maps yet. Uh, serpentine from, uh, uh, and uh, picrolite from uh, North Syria, uh, which travels in various directions. And then the grey blob is basalt, which is the most extraordinary one. Uh, it's a very recent paper that uh, has just been published in the last few weeks uh, in which uh, uh, the sources of basalt used on late 
epipaleolithic sites in northern Israel has been uh, uh, geologically identified and what has turned up is that the basalt sources they're using are not the nearest basalt which is 10, 30, 50 kilometers away but basalt from northeast Jordan which is 50, 80, 100 plus kilometers away and they're using this for grinding stones and mortars yeah? Yeah. this is not small things like beads or little chips of obsidian this is damn great lumps of black basalt moving 100 plus kilometers in exchange networks. Communities also shared ideas, imagery, tastes in the way they made their projectile points, ways of preparing cores and producing blade blanks. But we won't go into all that. Deference to you, Madam President. <laughs> I will have more to say about these networks of sharing and symbolic exchange later. But now let's just recap what we've seen in this lecture. I talked about a trend to sedentary communities and communities of increasing size. I argued that population was growing at an increasing rate. We saw changes in domestic architecture as buildings were built larger and more complex. And I mentioned that communal storage and food processing seems to have given way to control at household level. In this context, we can note that the adoption of mixed farming became widespread during the early Neolithic period, aiding the growth of community size and fueling the expansion of population. 